Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Red Zone Podcast. Anthony Freddy, Joey Dwyer, Leo Staudter with you guys. And once again, we get to do the show from our living residences in the Bloomington Normal area. So, guys, once again, welcome back to the show. It's good to be back. Um, I'm glad you didn't say living rooms because I'm absolutely in my bedroom right now. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, it's still nice to be uh, with you guys. Hopefully in a couple of weeks here, we'll be back to in studio with uh, a little more up-to-date information, not recording Wednesday <laughs> nights. But uh, for now, we just got to do what we can. Yeah, I'm really missing being in the basement of Fell Hall just down there where it seems like it almost has a climate of its own. It's different doing this from my bedroom for sure. I mean, yeah. I guess, Leo, Leo, we were both down in the basement, what, yesterday, two days ago for TV 10, so. I suppose so. We could have snuck in and maybe done the show from the studio. <laughs> Nobody I don't know how happy um, Steve and Deb would have been about that, but, you know, you got to do what you got to do for the good of the show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not ideal, but, you know, it's just the best way we can do it to keep everyone safe and to keep the show going, to give the listeners something uh, to listen to during this time. Uh, we got a great show planned for you guys today or tonight. We, we're going to talk about Redbird Athletics and everything that has developed with athletics within the past week. Then we'll move to the MLB trade deadline, see what happened, recap all the trades, see how it will impact the teams. Then we'll talk about the NBA playoffs and NHL playoffs. So without further ado, we'll start with the Redbird athletics um issue that is going around on campus um just to catch those up to speed athletic director larry lyons made a comment um last thursday that said all redbird lives matter uh and then many of the athletes took to social media to express their beliefs about the situation we saw the athletes and the coaches then the following day lyons apologized for his comment in a Zoom meeting with just the athletes. Then over the weekend, the athletes have a bunch of demands they want fulfilled by the athletic department. And then on Monday, the athletic department revealed their action plan for social change. More details about this stuff is online at WZND.com. But before we get into it, we do have some of the thoughts from people from uh, Redbird Athletics. We will hear three people speak. It will be Timothy Johnson, Maya Robinson, and Jordan Wilkerson. Well, so for me, the context of it is it is obviously extremely similar to the movement that is a counter movement, All Lives Matter. And for me, All Lives Matter really just means that you're unable to acknowledge that there are certain lives that are being attacked and being um, subjected to discrimination and discriminatory practices and racism and the specific Black Lives Matter case more than others. Like, because obviously, certainly, you know, the All Lives Matter statement, word for word, is true. However, all lives are not under attack for some specific thing about their character, for us being humans, right? No, like, uh, humans aren't being attacked for being humans. They're being attacked for their race, their gender, their class, sexuality. And so, for me, it's just that it is so much of a counter-movement of, instead of acknowledging that black lives are under attack, by saying all lives matter, you're saying essentially that we don't really care that black lives are under attack more than the others or that, you know, whatever. Women are under attack more than others or pe- people in the LGBTQ community are under attack more than others. We're just going to say all lives matter and try and forget that certain people are struggling more or less because of their identity. Um, but my coaches are pretty... They're pretty supportive, um, especially Coach Wood. Like, she's very supportive. Like, she's trying to learn about what we go through and how we how she can help. Like, she's been there since the George Floyd situation. Like, she's just trying to learn. And she was trying to learn, like, everything that goes on in our culture and, like, how we go out and be, like, racially profiled and all, whatever else there is in the world. She's trying to learn. So, if we only have one black coach on the coaching staff so he he can only do so much if he doesn't have the support from his you know colleagues either so it's it's really nice and I'm very blessed to have coaches that are you know sticking to our side and not just 
when it fly by and not be such a big deal. Uh, this movement is bigger than us. It's bigger than just ISU. It's bigger than just you know, Illinois. It's, this is something that a lot of people struggle with uh, beyond, you know, this this institution. And some of our regular mission students, you know, uh, they deal with the same thing. And uh, a lot of the reps, you know, to, that were dealing with this and that are working closely with me and the other few reps are uh, feel the same way. I know. Some players were telling me that, you know, they didn't care about their season. They were fully committed to not playing a, uh, a game. And I feel the same way. I, I would have been, you know, as long as, you know, they didn't meet our demands and they, you know, keep uh, not upholding their diversity of pillar that they say that they, the Illinois State is founded on, I would be 100% ready to uh, not compete at all. Some nice words said by both Johnson, Robinson, and Wilkerson about the issue at hand. So let's dive into it. What are your opening thoughts on what has developed over the past um, few weeks? Or past well, week, I should say. I thought it was very interesting getting to hear the opinions of um, some of the black student athletes here at ISU because, you know, I as three white guys sitting around doing a podcast, we don't experience – the kind the kinds of oppression that they're talking about so it's our job to listen and listening to that at, once Larry Lyons said that I knew that it was not good like when he said that I was like who in his PR team cleared that um but then listening I realized how much deeper it goes and how much that our black student athletes and our student athletes of color really felt feel taken advantage of and it's their demands are not that much when you think about all of the revenue that they bring to the athletic department and for there to be any foot dragging on the side of the ISU administration, I think is ridiculous. I think Larry Lyon shouldn't have said it in the first place. And now I think that it's ISU's responsibility to cater to the demands of their athletes and their students who pay a lot of money <laughs> to go here and I think it's the job of ISU to be on the for, forefront of correcting these wrongs. Definitely. Uh, those are some great points, Joey. Like what you said with Larry Lyons making that statement, it's in this time like where words carry so much meaning, sure, he might have had the right intentions, but you have to think about what you're saying there and what it could mean, what it could be taken as. And for him to say that, it, it was a way of belittling the Black Lives Matter movement to an extent because he's, but I think Maya Robinson had the quote that a red bird isn't a life. It's not a race. It's not a type of person. It's something you choose. So to say that it, that all red bird lives matter, I think it did kind of, I could see how that could be taken in the context where he's saying that this movement doesn't matter as much. So, and especially for hearing now, some of the stuff the, the black student athletes have had to say, like, they put so much effort, so much time, dedication into this school and for the person who's basically in charge of them to kind of say this thing you care so much about doesn't mean as much as you think it does. Like, for him to say it like that, it, I think it kind of takes away from what they've been trying to accomplish. And they were right in putting out that list of demands and potentially boycotting because you have to think about in this day and age, you have to think about what you're saying why and why you're saying it. And I think they definitely are just in this because they, they, I could see why they, why this is offensive because it is, this is an important movement. And for them to, to for Larry Lyons to make that statement, it definitely takes away from some of that. And uh, Jordan Wilkerson said something in, in his interview uh, that I don't know if it made it into the shortened clip that we included here, but he was talking about how the ISU athletics department had released a statement saying how they supported black lives matter. And they had done all this face value work to say that they support their black student athletes. And then to come out with something, this tone deaf really takes away from all the work they had put in and makes the athletes here think, man, were they really on our side? And, trying to 
rectify what's going on in our society right now? Or were they just putting this face on so that they could look good in the media? And it really does delegitimize a lot of the work that ISU athletics has been trying to put in. I would, yeah, I couldn't agree more about that. Um, with uh, Lyons' statement, you can understand a little bit where he's coming from with the all red lives matter, trying to do a spinoff of the all black lives matter movement kind of thing. But those kind of words put together in that interview, it's definitely understandable um, why the athletes were frustrated with it, even though he did apologize. Um, some of them, you know, felt maybe it wasn't a genuine apology or even with this plan that they're trying to put in place, that was that it was a bit rushed, that maybe they were trying just to come up with something as quick as they can to try and stop the bleeding. But it is fair that the Redbirds want to try and um, boycott like they put on social media um, for Ruts White right for them so that all um, so that basically everybody can be created equal. And um, another point that Jordan brought up in his interview that I know did make the, make the cut was he was talking about how him and some of the other reps for the other sports were talking and they said that they're content with not playing this year. If it means that ISU will take a look at what they, what atmosphere they have and actually try to change some of the things that are problematic and that have burdened these student athletes. And I think that we see, we see that in all kinds of sports, not just here at ISU collegiately, but in the NBA um, when the bucks walked out and then leagues across the nation followed um, boycotting games, because at the end of the day, the most important thing to people who run athletic departments or who own major league sports teams is the money and the service that these players are providing is what makes them the money. And so the way to really get it through to these people who are in these positions of power is hit them in the pockets. And so if ISU doesn't do something to rectify the situation and doesn't really listen to what their black student athletes have to say, then I think that it's very justified that they don't want to compete this year for a school that's not going to have their back. Definitely, Joey. And that, that says something about like the character of these student athletes that they are willing because they're not, they have been put in so much dedication, blood, sweat, and tears for this school. And they haven't seen a dime of those profits because they're amateurs, they're student athletes. So they, the school essentially profits off of them and they don't receive any kind of compensation for it other than their scholarships. And so for them to say like, we're going to take away that source of income that we generate if we don't get the change we want, like that says something about them that this is something so important to take a stand for that they're willing to risk everything. And I think that is something about this generation that now we're seeing, like they're not willing to just be complicit with just the typical, they're not willing just to fall in the line and be part of that system where they are willing to speak up and be part of the change and be the generation that changes the culture in America. Yeah. And we've seen it not only in professional sports, but it's starting with these collegiate athletes as well. We've seen U of I has done some marches, same thing with Alabama with their um, football players that was led by coach Saban. But, you know, at some point, you know, with everything that's going on in this world, people just, you know, someone needs to put their foot down and kind of say, you know, enough is enough. We want to be treated equally. And with these sports, like you said, you know, um, you really give a lot to these athletes, given everything that they have put into, you know, all our, their hard work and dedication just to get to this um, point in their lives to compete at the division one level um, to be athletes. But when something like this comes up, it's, they might be bummed um, that they have to put the sport on hold, but some of the athletes might say potentially that it's bigger than, you know, track and field, or it's bigger than football, that this issue going on is bigger than sports. And that's something that uh, Kimathi said in his interview was he was talking about being able to post on social media about uh, what Larry Lyons said and, uh, he really 
was echoing the sentiment that a lot of people in this country still are on the side of, you know, shut up and dribble or athletes should stay out of politics. But we're really turning a corner to where they're inseparable now that athletes want to be treated more than just a body. It's athletes believe in something and they have the right to use their platform. And so I think it's really important that they are able to do that. And something that the athletes have organized, and I wanted to bring this up is if you're listening to this Thursday, tomorrow, um, there is an athletes March for black voices uh, beginning at six. It's outside of Redbird arena. They're obviously following like, social distancing protocols. Everybody's got to wear a mask, but this is something that the student athletes here can do to make their voices heard. And I'm sure that there are going to be a lot of empowering speeches there. And I am very excited to see what the athletes want out of the university because they have their demands and the, the university needs to meet those for, for no other reason than to be on the right side of history. And I feel like this March, it's not just about sports and it's not just about the black student athletes. This is about just the culture of equality on campus too. Like this, it starts with the sports, but it can trickle down, make things better for the whole campus for everyone at ISU and truly make this a better campus. And it's, great to see that these athletes are on the same page here that they are using that they are are unifying around this cause and doing something about it and organizing this march to try to get change they're going to make the university put their money where their mouth is here and make meet their list of demands hopefully yeah like you said um you know hats off to the athletes for what they've done um to organize this march because as we've seen this march that's going to happen um, on Friday. So if you're watching on th- or listening on Thursday, it'll be tomorrow. Um, just they organized that all by themselves. Um, and even with the speakers too, to bring in speakers um, who align with their values and beliefs, it will be interesting to see. So I definitely, um, you know, like you said, Joey, you know, I'm excited um, to see what, um, Redbird athletes can do and see how everything will kind of um, unfold for now. But um, that'll just about do it for um, the Redbird athletics coverage. We'll take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the MLB trade deadline. You're listening to the Red Zone on the Pulse of Redbird Nation, 103.3 WZND. Welcome back to the Red Zone here on the Pulse of Redbird Nation 103.3 WZND. We are now joined by Andrew Evola from the News and Sports Department. Andrew, welcome to the show. How's it going? Pretty good. Can't complain. Glad to have you on the show. We always like bringing news and sports guests on to see what they want to talk about. And you wanted to talk about the MLB trade deadline as that happened this past Monday and see how all those trades have unfolded, excuse me, and how they will impact the teams um, heading into the last half of the season. But we look with the Cubs and the White Sox. The Cubs made a bunch of moves. um, And then the Chicago White Sox, they were pretty stagnant. Uh, during the trade deadline. So let's dive right into it, fellas. Yeah, I mean, the White Sox, I mean, obviously they're they're playing pretty good baseball right now. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I just think they're really, really looking forward, looking for or trying to shop any other young prospects because obviously they got a lot, a lot of going for them right now and they're pretty hot. You know, Giulio threw a no-hitter the other day. They've been – Robert's been crushing the ball and they just overall been playing really well as a team. So I, I – I get why they didn't want to make a move at the deadline, but the Cubs, I, I like the Cubs with a couple of ads they did. They needed some bullpen arms and they added, um, I believe it was Chafin from the Diamondbacks and um, another reliever from the Red Sox, I believe. And obviously they've had their bullpen struggles throughout the year. I mean, you just, as watching the games, you can see, you can tell when you, you have a lead late in the game and you just don't really feel comfortable, you know, as a, as a Cubs fan, you know, just watching the game because, I mean, it happens just about every other game where a bullpen blows it. But I I think that they had a couple of good ads for just, just at least depth, more depth to their bullpen, I guess. And they also added Cameron Maven, too, who's a veteran outfielder, which I think will 
be just a good locker room presence for them and hopefully give them a little more push to make a strong finish to the season. So Andrew, I want to ask you, because this is something that I've talked to some of my friends about just about the season and how it's shortened. But do you think that with the shortened season and the fact that the trade deadline came only what 32 games into the season and I know it's only it's a shortened season but still usually you'll have way more to kind of get a feel for your team do you think that any of these moves will have better or worse impacts than they would have had there been a normal trade deadline um I I feel like it's 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 just such a weird season you know it's just like tough to tell with anything you know because obviously like in a normal season you have a you have about it's probably about like close to 80 games to at least feel your team out. Like now you're kind of sense of urgency, you know what I mean? Like, especially if you're trying to win and you're trying to make a push for another world series or another deep playoff push. So I think, I just think you kind of got to have a short lease on the season this year. You know, obviously like some guys have been struggling for the Cubs and like, for example, Albert Armora, who was a big part of the team last season, he just got sent to the alternate site. And obviously we traded for Cameron Maven, another outfielder. So, I mean, I just feel like it it kind of has a big impact. You know, you, you're kind of thinking – you have to think a lot, I guess, kind of into the season because, you know, you, you don't really have a lot of time. It's 30 games and you're already halfway through the season and, like, you're either going to fold up and just call the year and not, not make a big push or make a couple moves and try to make a run at this thing, you know. I think one thing that played into the both teams' trade deadline – prowess was this year the deadline was different where you can only trade players that are on your current roster or on your alternate site so those are obviously players that the franchise has a lot of investment in and expects to be playing this year so I think if you're looking at both teams you kind of had to deal a little bit differently than you would in a normal season where you don't want to give up maybe another player like Albert Almora because you might still have hopes for him next season or hope that he could contribute to this season so you had to kind of make more with less in terms of the trade market so I think these teams had to be a little bit smarter with the moves they're making, maybe go for some low risk, high reward moves, which I feel like with the bullpen arms with Osich and Chafin that the Bulls at, or the, the Cubs added, those are definitely some very low risk moves, but if used correctly, they could pay some big dividends for their bullpen. Yeah, definitely. You know, that's, it's honestly, I just felt going into this year, I like I'm a Cubs fan, but I mean, like, I, I just like baseball in general, but going into this year, there was definitely a big concern to the bullpen. And I feel like if they didn't sign it, which they didn't really sign anybody in the off season, except a couple smaller, like uh, smaller ceiling players to, for the bullpen, they needed to add some more if they wanted to go anywhere this season. Right. Yeah, and, um, you talked about a little bit about the bullpen and trying to trade for some of the pitchers. Um, with you mentioned it um they got some of the players in the offseason they um got Craig Kimbrell um Mm -hmm. who people had um expectations for uh given how he's played in the past but he was struggling a little bit so it's kind of smart um to make some trades um pertaining to the bullpen because the bullpens really is what um is really what's going to help you out on defense trying to force guys to strike out, you know, and swing a certain way, or especially, you know, come in, you know, in the eighth, ninth inning when your team's up, you know, you don't want a pitcher, you know, to blow that lead. You want to give them that save to kind of get the Cubs going. Cause the way it's been going, they're not as consistent of a team as the Soxo this year. Yeah. I mean, as you, you can tell, I mean, the, the series, they what played last weekend, I think the White Sox and the Cubs. And as you can see, the White Sox are just, they're on another level right now. I mean, the Cubs started off really hot at the beginning of the year, but the White Sox are just playing some really good baseball right now. And as you can see, I mean, the, our pitching is just not as good. You know, it's just – the white, like the White Sox have a pretty solid starting rotation. And the Cubs do too, you know me wrong. Darvish has played really well. I mean, he was just named NL Pitcher of the Month. And uh, Hendricks is, you know, he's just a solid player. It's just – we're just not as deep. I feel like in where we need to be. You know, we, we got the offense. We can do it. But it, it, the offense doesn't matter if you can't hold a team under five runs, you know, into a game or hold a three run lead going late in the games. Cause Kimbrell's had his struggles this year. I mean, to be honest, he has not looked at all with the money that they paid him last season, halfway through last season, what they paid him hasn't really paid off for them yet. 
But I I do like the signing of this offseason was uh, Jeremy Jeffress. who got him from Milwaukee, signed him. He's he's performed pretty well this year. I think he got the save last night, I believe, in the extra inning game against Pittsburgh, if I remember correctly. But like I said, if you, you can't, you got to have some players step up in the bullpen to pitch well for you guys, for at least the Cubs to be successful. And yeah, I, 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 I couldn't help but notice that Leo and I were both smiling when you were talking about how the Sox are on another level, because this is like a lot of, a lot of emotional trauma from 10 plus seasons of just garbage baseball. And now the Sox have finally got their prospects in order. They're finally paying off. And I'm having so much fun watching White Sox baseball. And I could not tell you the last time I was able to say that. This is a fun, fun team to watch. They're so young. The bats are so hot. And Jose Abreu is otherworldly this year. I am over the moon happy. And I was talking at the beginning of the season. I was like, you know, whoever wins this, because everybody's talking about how good the Cubs are going to be. So I was like, whoever wins the World Series is going to be a huge asterisk by it because it was s- such a short season that doesn't really prove anything. But now I'm like, you know what? A World Series is a World Series. Yeah, and no. That, oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was saying with the White Sox, with their problem the past few years has been lack of consistency throughout the lineup where – Sometimes Tim Anderson would get hot, but then Abreu would go cold or uh, vice versa. Abreu would go on a tear, but then Anderson couldn't find the bat. But now it finally seems like from top to bottom, this lineup is clicking that they just have a little bit of that team chemistry that they clearly didn't have in past seasons. If you want to look at some stuff that happened in the locker room a few years ago, like the locker room, the clubhouse was a bit of a danger zone for the White Sox, but now they seem to just have that natural chemistry and they're playing well as a cohesive unit which they haven't been for the past few years. So now that they got that team chemistry going, you could just tell that they're having fun out there. We saw Jose Abreu on Tuesday night where he was just yelling, running around the bases when Eloy hit a double. And then to that, he says, I don't want to run that much. Eloy should just hit it out of the park more. So you just <laughs> having fun when they're playing. Yeah, at the rate some of their younger players are playing like um, Jimenez and Robert, Definitely, if they can hit him out of the park, they can do it. Just to tear, even Robert's been on the season. You mentioned Abreu leading the team with 12 home runs this season, um, just having a phenomenal year um, for the White Sox. And we've been talking a little bit about the trade deadline. The White Sox made the decision to stand pat, which I kind of agree with. Obviously, there are some areas they need. They needed another starting pitcher, they needed another bullpen arm and they needed a probably an upgraded right field. But two of those three, they could probably add from within. They've had Dane Dunning come up and start two games fairly well. He could be that fifth starting pitcher they need. And in terms of bullpen arms, they've had Aaron Bummer, who was probably their best reliever last season. He's been on the injured list for most of the year. So if he could come back before the postseason starts, that could be their equivalent to trading for a big bullpen arm. So I think they're hoping for some positive steps from the players they already have on their roster. I think they've been giving Adam Engel some more reps at right field. So they're just hoping they, I don't think they wanted to mortgage any prospects here for this weird season, because you don't really know how it's going to go. I think next off season, they're going to have to spend some money, maybe trade for a big, big name player, whether it's a pitcher or an outfielder, but this year they're putting their money on the table and going with the guys they have on their team and with the way this playoff format works, they, I think they got the guys in the room where they can make it and make some noise in the postseason. Yeah, and plus the AL Central has looked pretty much theirs for the past two weeks or so. I think right now as we're recording, um, they're down to the Twins, so a Cleveland win would put Cleveland one game up. But still, they are sitting well within playoff range right now. And I think you're right, Leo, if they – can make it into the playoffs with some confidence with some heat behind them I really don't see how they could get absolute like get killed in the playoffs like there are some teams that are obviously better in the AL but for the most part they're a super solid team their starting pitching is pretty good their bats are incredible and the bullpen is not bad and Leo I I completely agree with if they get Aaron Bummer back this is going to be a revitalized team. Having somebody like that being able to come out 
and pitch your middle innings, I think will give this team the push that they need to really get over the hump and be an actual contender. Absolutely. I mean, this year is just all about establishing that winning culture. And I think, obviously, obviously I'm not justifying why they didn't trade for anybody. I think it was a cheap move by the Sox, not anybody. But this is almost like saying, okay, we're not going to go in and get any help for you guys. You guys got to got to make this push by on your own. Let's establish that winning culture from within. So it's on guys like Andrew veterans on the team and maybe even guys like Giolito to step up and lead this team to a postseason. And then in the off season, they could say, okay, this is what we have. This is what we need. We saw that last year. Now let's go, let's go out, get another pitcher, go out, get a right fielder. So I think this year is all about learning and getting experience for the young players. Yeah. I, agree about that we've we've seen with the Sox they have the possibility to make a contention in the playoffs but the things that might worry some Sox fans is the amount of playoff experience on their roster so while you know these bats are really hot right now and Sox fans hope that those bats can stay out with the playoff experience who knows how those young guys can compete in that atmosphere so like you said Leo maybe building them up um, you know for the next season or two then we'll be able to get to where they are or where they were like in 05 and you know they're gonna have a trophy to celebrate with you know come October November yeah I'd say one thing that's maybe different about baseball and other sports where playoff experience matters I'd say a lot for pitchers but for hitters it's all about confidence and who's hot at the right time so we've seen and this White Sox team they got a lot of confident guys I think uh Tim Anderson will be the first to tell you that he believes he's one of the best shortstops in the league and it's that kind of confidence that could help these players rise to the occasion in the postseason. So I think for the pitchers, it's about getting them innings when the games matter a lot more. But for the guys like Anderson and Jimenez and Robert, it's just about getting those at-bats in the postseason and putting your best foot forward because these guys don't seem to get phased by the moment. They just seem to rise to the occasion every every week. Yeah, I think so. Oh, go ahead. Just, yeah, Andrew, you can go. Oh, God, I'll, um, I'll just say, yeah, I mean – I feel like this year, you know, especially, I feel like going into the season, I feel that the White Sox kind of benefited from this short season. You know, obviously got a lot of young players. And obviously in a longer season, you're going to have your slump, like your dog days of like middle of summer where you're not really playing too well. But like, I just feel like overall to have some guys, hot, when you're hot, you're hot. You know what I mean? It's kind of, I feel like it just really benefits the White Sox and how they're playing gives our team some confidence, you know, and obviously, obviously the young guys need a lot of confidence just coming in the league. They don't really, they're still trying to establish themselves. And by starting off, or at least they started off a little strug, sluggish, I thought, begin the year, but then obviously have just caught fire the past couple of weeks and really hopefully going to benefit them the rest of the way. I mean, it's tough for me to say as a Cubs fan because, you know, obviously I'm not a huge fan of the Sox, but it's also been enjoy. It's I've enjoyed watching them just perform well and, you know, the young prospects, like, how could you not like Luis Robert? Like, I mean, look at him. He's, he's killing the ball. Like, I mean, he homered last night, right, too, I think, to tie the game for them or to take the lead, I think, late in the game. And, you know, it's just – as a baseball fan, you like to see it. You know, you like to see the young players play well and a lot of young stars perform well. I mean, like, you got, like, guys like Robert, and then you got Tatis for this Padres. It's been fun to watch this year. And it's just – I really just feel like this season's been really fun to watch, you know, overall to seeing some young guys grow and – become stars but yeah I um that's a great way to put it and to finish off the segment will be a really entertaining finish to the MLB season the last half of the season that they have but it brings us to our red zone question of the week with this trade deadline over how will the Chicago teams fare in the playoff will both the Cubs and Sox make it will just the Cubs make it will just the White Sox make it or will neither team make it We'll have to see what happens. We'll take a break. When we come back, we're going to dive into some playoff talk for, on the red zone on the Pulse of Red Bird Nation, 103.3 WZND. Right. Well, welcome back to the red zone here on the Pulse of Red Bird Nation, 103.3 WZND. Anthony Freddy, Leo Stoddaher, Joey Dwyer, and Andrew Evola with you guys for this evening's show. So we talked about the MLB a little bit, one of three – of the major sports leagues that are going on right now, but we got the NBA playoffs going on as well. We got game seven 
uh, between Houston and OKC, the final quarterfinal game, and then the semifinals are starting to tip off just as well. So it's been really interesting to see um, what it's been offered. We look at the Nuggets. They were down 3-2 to two in their series, and then Jamal Murray able to just carry them, you know, with that 50-point game to force the game seven. Then again, um, in game seven, you know, to uh, get them into the second round. I would just like to say that before we go to Denver, Utah, that if you pull back a red zone from, I think, February, I said that the Heat were a team to watch out for, and they're up 2 nothing on the Bucks right now. So I just want to throw that out there, not to say that I told you so, but, but <laughs> <laughs> I may have been correct about the Heat and Jimmy Butler. But anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Denver, Utah, um, Jamal Murray is an absolute unit, and so is Donovan Mitchell. And I don't know if you guys saw the thing on Bleacher Report where they like had a moment after Game 7. They were talking to each other. I was like, I would pay money to know what they said to each other because those are two guys that just ran that series, and that was so fun to watch. Jamal Murray especially – that looks like when you're playing a pickup game with your buddies and then you got like the one friend that played high school basketball was playing and it's just miles better than everybody else. And just what did he put up? Like 41 points in the final game? Like he was just on another level. It just seemed like every shot he was taking was going in. It was just a great individual performance to watch. And especially he rallied that team around him to get that comeback and win the series. That's like, uh, Ferretti, you might be the only one on the podcast right now old enough to get this, but do you remember Elijah Clarence? Yes. Elijah Clarence, used to, he used to come to the rack and play <laughs> pickup basketball. And this, it, Elijah Clarence, was, uh, he was an IEC basketball player for a year and uh, from Sweden, I think, uh, somewhere over in Europe. And he was like six, 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 seven, and just dummy kids. <laughs> like, and I was one, I was very much included, especially my freshman year, because I didn't play basketball in high school, so I was so bad. But I was tall, so they put me at center. Um, but that's how that's how this series looked. It was just two guys dominating the rest of the floor, and I'm excited to see what uh, Denver can do in the next round because I think they're kind of come in hot, riding the coattails of Jamal Murray. Yeah, I mean, that series was just honestly probably the most entertaining series of playoffs that I've watched probably, I feel like, in the past couple of years. Because, you know, I feel like the NBA has kind of been getting a bad rap, you know, like for the past couple of years. Obviously, you had the Warriors just pretty much blowing out the whole league for most of the last three or four years. And then, obviously, they had a down year, down year this year. And I just feel like just – I feel like the bubble has really brought some really good basketball to watch. You know, that the, the Jazz and Nuggets, that was – like I said, probably one of the most entertaining series I've watched in a while. And it showed in game seven. I mean, the final score is what, 80 to 78. You don't, you don't see that really anymore nowadays. Like obviously you're talking back like in the nineties, like, yeah, that was a common occurrence in the playoff games. But nowadays, you know, teams are scoring hundred, 120 points a night. You could just really tell that both teams wanted it. And that showed with the final score being only 80 to 78. Most teams have that nowadays at the end of the third quarter. And I just, it was really entertaining. I, I thought, Going into it, I thought Denver would mop the floor with Utah, but Utah really impressed me, to be honest. Yeah, it's really interesting just to see, you know, they got, what, like three, three, four months off, and, you know, a bunch of them, like Murray, have looked like they haven't even missed a step. But to your point, you know, with scoring, you know, we've seen, you know, I think the Lakers at one point had like 87 heading into halftime. Like, that's just unheard of. Some teams, you know, if they're struggling, you know, they're lucky to get 87 in four quarters, and they're doing it halfway through the game. Yeah. And st staying on Denver, I just looked it up to make sure that I was right, but they're playing the Clippers next round. And so do you guys foresee a lot of problems? Because just thinking off the top of my head about this series, all I can think about is Kawhi and Pat Bev shutting down Jamal Murray. And then where does the offense go for Denver? Because Jokic has been a non-factor. Yeah, I think playoff Kawhi is just a completely different player. Dating back to his days with the Spurs, like when he gets going in the playoffs, he is probably one of the top five players in the league. 
And I think he's going to create a lot of problems, kind of neutralize Jamal Murray. And then we've seen the Clippers, they got deeper options at two and three than the Nuggets do. So it's really going to be interesting to see how Denver, if they can have anybody else step up to that next level. Yeah, I feel, I feel if Jokic does not show up, like, I mean, obviously he has his nights, but, you know, I feel like if he doesn't really step up this series that the Clippers will easily win this series. I mean, I, I like Denver a lot. I think they're a really good team. Jamal Murray obviously have showed he's a really talented player and Jokic has showed in regular season and at the start of the bubble that he's a big time player as well. But I feel like if they kind of need some more guys to step up to the plate. For Clip, especially the Clippers, they're pretty deep. You got Lou Will, you got Kawhi, you got Pat Beverly. Montrez Harrell has been pretty good off the bench, and they're just pretty deep team overall. And like you said, playoff Kawhi is he's that's another man. You know, he's he's had some some great playoff series. I mean, yeah, you saw him even with like some pictures posted on social media. The way Kawhi gets going, he they're posting pictures of him looking like the Terminator. Like he is just inhuman out there the kind of numbers and stuff he's putting up in the way he's able to do it so it will be a test definitely of the Denver Nuggets depth on their bench to see what could happen but um let's transition things over a little bit I guess talk about the Miami Heat Joe Mr. Joey Dwyer you I do remember one of the shows um last semester you're like they you know could be coming up you said you know with guys like Tyler Harrow and stuff and um, we mentioned that we're recording this on Wednesday night. They just beat the Milwaukee Bucks 116-114 to 114 to take a 2-0 series lead. And it was all thanks, I believe, to Jimmy Butler, who knocked down two free throws with no time on the clock to give them that victory. And the Heat, I, I love the Heat. I was The first NBA game I ever owned was NBA 07 for the PSP. And I loved playing as the Heat. It was uh, Shaq. D Wade, Udonis Haslam, like that is prime. But they are still a very, very good team. But I did not have faith in them getting past Milwaukee just because Milwaukee has been so, so good for the past two years. But in these first two games, like they are, they have Milwaukee's number. And I wouldn't be surprised if they take this game in five. And that, that is probably going to come back to bite me now that I say it. Like, Milwaukee's going to win in six, and you guys are going to be like, wow, Joe, you're so dumb. But they have just been playing super well. Um, there was a little bit of controversy about the officiating um, in that last game. A lot of people on Twitter were not happy about it, but that's just how the game goes. And I'm sure that if it were the team that I didn't want to win, I'd be like, oh, the officiating was so bad. But the team that I like won, so – I can say, you know what, that's just refs blow some calls and it's just part of the game. <laughs> yeah, this has been a very interesting series because I feel like Milwaukee is the team that has probably responded the worst to the bubble where they were the f- favorite in the East before the lockdown hit. And then they haven't looked like that same team afterwards. And the reemergence of Jimmy Butler has been great to watch because with the Bulls, he looked like he was a rising young star in the NBA, part of that next generation of players. And he had, he had a weird phase with just those years in Minnesota than last year in Philadelphia. But now he seems to have found the right fit in Miami and has the right coach to go with him and the right group of players around him where he hasn't been a problem. And if anything, you've seen the locker rooms he's left have actually, those teams have fallen apart. So maybe he wasn't the problem in Chicago or Minneapolis or Philadelphia, maybe those teams were just a powder keg waiting for a spark where Jimmy Butler was the person that called the players out on their, on their uh, nonsense where he was just all the, maybe he was the one in the right. And now it seems like he's in the right situation with a good locker room dynamic. And he has just been flourishing under there. So as a Bulls fan, that's been fun to watch has been him coming into his own finally. Oh yeah. He is. He's really proving himself as a, top caliber player who can carry a team because he's undoubtedly the main guy on the heat right now. And so he's really proving, I think to himself as well as the rest of the league that he has the ability to carry a team um, to be a true contender. Yeah, definitely. Oh, God. 
Yeah. Oh, no, you can go again. Yeah. Um, no, I said, yeah, definitely. Like, the Heat, honestly, they've been one of my favorite teams to watch in the bubble. They got a lot of lot of young talent. I mean, you got Kendrick Nunn. You got Tyler Hero. Duncan Robinson has emerged as a pretty big player for them, you know, become, becoming a big-time shooter, you know. And I just really enjoy watching the Heat. They're very, very young, very talented. And I, I honestly, going into the series, I, I believe that Miami could beat the Bucks because, you know, the Bucks have – not really look too great since they got into the bubble. I mean, Orlando obviously beat them. I think it was game one of that series, but then obviously they won four straight. But still, Orlando gave them a little trouble, and I didn't really think Orlando was that – nothing special. You know, they got Aaron Gordon. That's about that's about all they got. But I I said this kind of too, like, like Joey said, like a long time ago before, like, the playoffs started. I was like, Miami could make a little run at the East. You know, they, they got enough talent and – like Jimmy Butler, he's emerged as, like Joey said, a big-time caliber player. Like, he's shown. He had, what, 40 in the first game, I think, and pretty much carried him to the game one victory. And then today, you know, played a big game today, and they got the victory over Milwaukee. I would just hate to see them make it to the finals and then get clobbered by whatever team comes out of the West because the West is just so, so overpowered. It's ridiculous. But – you know, they could still build off of an Eastern Conference championship and then in the next couple of years, let some of those really young players develop a little bit. Then they'll be super um, powerhouses in the East. And maybe the dynamic will transition back over from the West to the East because you got young teams like Toronto and Boston and Miami who are really all starting to come up. So, Yeah, it will be interesting to see what happens as the NBA playoffs unfold we got that final game seven tonight between the Rockets and Thunder to close out the opening series then it's going to be fully the semifinals for the NBA that'll just about do it for our coverage when we come back we're going to take things to the ice to talk about the NHL playoffs you're listening to the red zone on the pulse of Redbird Nation 103.3 WZND Welcome back to the Red Zone on the Pulse of Red Bird Nation, 103.3 WZND. We now dive into our final segment of the show, which is not pick six as it usually is. Um, as soon, we in the past. soon. We got pick six soon. I was going to say next week is when the NFL officially kicks off, so we will have a pick six next week. Thank goodness yes, that'll sir. be exciting. But just as exciting is the NHL bubble that's going on in their playoffs. They have their Elite Eight moving down to the final four teams. We saw Tampa Bay advance over Boston in double overtime. Um, and some other teams are playing. Colorado just won their game, so they forced a game seven. They came in to the Star Series. They were down 3-1, and now it's game seven. And – the stars have looked insane. And granted, I am not going to talk bad about the Avs because coming into the playoffs, coming into the bubble, they were my team that I thought was going to go all the way. But obviously, Grubauer going down, and they, they lost Eric Johnson, who's a top-line D for them. And so that's really hurt them. But it's nice to see these young guys on Colorado being able to step it up. Obviously, like Nathan McKinnon, Gabriel Landeskog have been there for them for the past five years. But some of the younger guys are starting to make their presence known. And this game seven is going to be incredible because the stars have been playing out of their mind. So if Colorado can put up a good front for, um, oh man, the French guy that's in net right now, I cannot Francois. remember. Something. Francois, yes, right. thank yeah. you. Um, if they can put up a good front for him, I think that's going to be a nice game to watch. Hasn't and- played the past couple of games though, I think, because I think Hutchinson is in net now. He was in, the one for the past couple of games. So um, we'll have to see what happens, but um, continue, Leah. I, I just think this Colorado series, um, the main takeaway we've seen has been the emergence of Kale McCarr as he's probably going to be one of the best defensemen in the league for the next 10 years. We see he struggled at the start of the series. He had one where he almost put the puck in his own, he basically did put the puck in his own net. But these past two games, he has looked like a grown man considering he's only, what, 20 years old, he has just been playing as a top-pairing defenseman, moving the puck with authority up and down the ice. I think him versus Miro Heiskanen, uh, the similar young defenseman for the Dallas Stars, is just terrible to watch as a Hawks fan, just knowing that those two young defensemen are going to run the Central Division for the next foreseeable future. 
But in terms of a hockey standpoint, this has been a very entertaining series because these are two teams that play the modern game very well, where they're not overly physical. They're not slow. They are just fast paced teams that can score in bunches. Like we saw with Colorado put up five goals in the first period the other night. These are two very exciting teams and possibly two cup contenders. I think Uh, goaltending is obviously the biggest issue though, for the avalanche. And you could also say that for the stars, because um, they've had some goalie controversy of their own. And so Qdobin being able to step up and step into that role and help them be so successful in the playoffs is awesome to see um, a veteran goaltender like that getting a, a second chance. But uh, this is just something I've been trying to figure out. If you're Dallas and let's say Dallas wins this series, they move on to the conference final, Ben Bishop comes back healthy, where do you go from there? Do you ride the hot hand that's been Qdobin? for the past series and a half, or do you put Ben Bishop back in there who objectively gives you a better chance to win? I think it's a difficult issue because I think it should be Kidobin's net until he doesn't deserve it maybe. And it's, that could be Dallas's silver bullet knowing that they have Ben Bishop waiting because he's a goalie that's taken his team to the Stanley cup final before. And if he was healthy in that final against the Hawks, maybe that series goes a different way. Uh, but he's an experienced goalie when he's healthy, one of the tops in the league. So I think if he gets to a hundred percent and Kyoven starts struggling, this is going to be a very interesting move for the stars to go to. I'm going to have to disagree with you, Leo. Um, I do think Ben Bishop is a uh, good experienced goalie, but the way that Kyoven has been playing, I think has been stronger um, than Ben Bishop. I mean, we take a look at game six when Colorado scored those full, those four goals um, on Ben Bishop, you know, he made his first start in a while, got four goals scored on him, really tough out him, and then pulled him out like that. Kudobin did give up a goal, but he was able just to stop the bleeding less than Ben Bishop, who felt like it was basically an empty net in there. So maybe um, give it to Kudobin until he's really struggling. Let's say, you know, they make it to the Stanley Cup final and – he really struggles in the first game and Ben Bishop really, um, you know, strong in between the pipes and they were able to come back and win game one. Then we got a different story, but for now, I think keep Qdobin in. Yeah, definitely. I think that's kind of what I was trying to get at where it's his net until he proves there's a reason it shouldn't be because he's been the one that's got them so far. And we've just seen though, he's been a career backup for most of his, he is what he is at this point. So I don't think you should be too confident. They, as a Dallas standpoint, I don't think they should be too confident in him, but he's been getting, doing his job to the extent they've needed him to do it. But this might not be a long-term fit is what I was getting at. Uh, yeah. Anything else you want to add? Andrew, got anything you want to add um, about um, NHL? Uh, to be honest, I'm not, I, I know Blackhawks, but not a lot about the, uh, <laughs> a lot about the other. The well, that's not going to help you pass the first round, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, like Q Dovin, like you said, he's been hot. I, in my opinion, in hockey, I feel like, I feel like hockey into more than most sports. If a goaltender's hot, you got to stick with it until obviously he proves otherwise, you know, but Ben Bishop is a great goalie, but I just feel like if he's hot, keep Q Dovin in there ride it out until he proves that he can't do it anymore. Absolutely. We will have to see what happens as the second round uh, hopefully will conclude shortly. And then we'll have our final four teams. Interesting enough, they're going to move into all one bubble. I believe it's the Edmonton bubble. They're going to move into for their remainder of them, but I do know they're going into one bubble for the final four teams, but that sadly will just about do it uh, for this week's edition of the Ren Zone. Andrew, thanks so much for coming on the show. We enjoyed having you. Thank you. I appreciate it. No problem. Just to recap what we talked about, we talked about Redbird Athletics and their march that will happen on Friday night at 6 and everything going on in response to a comment made by Athletic Director Dietz, or not Dietz, excuse me, Larry Lyons. They're both Larry. Um, Then we moved into the MLB trade deadline, talked about how that will impact the Cubs and Sox moving forward. Then we moved to the NBA bubble in Florida. Then we flew all the way up to Canada, not literally to talk about the NHL 
playoffs. If you missed any part of the show, it'll be on YouTube and on WZND.com. Surely, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at WZND Sports and at WZND, our regular Twitter. Same thing on all those platforms as well for WZND. For Andrew Evola, Leo Stoddaher, and Joey Dwyer, I'm Anthony Freddy saying so long. You've been listening to The Red Zone on the Pulse of Redbird Nation, 103.3 WZND.